You ready to get in the Word? Lift up the Word and repeat after me. I believe this is the Word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Today I would like to address a question uh, that was asked to me and also a, a statement that was made to me about becoming a Christian. And I'll just combine this question and this statement into one, one story. But when I was talking uh, to a, a person about becoming a Christian, they said, well, here's the deal. You believe that the rapture is going to take place. You believe that Jesus is coming back to get the church. So here's the deal. If you're right, when Jesus comes back, then I'll become a Christian. When, if, any, if everything happens the way you say it's going to happen, I mean, I've heard you say, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, the trumpet of God will sound, the dead in Christ will rise, then we who are alive will be caught up. When that happens, when I see that happen, I'll believe. Because according to you, once that happens, and Jesus catches away the church in the air, it's going to be seven years later, and then he's going to come back, and he's going to touch down on the Mount of Olives and set up his kingdom. So all I've got to do is just decide that when Jesus comes back and you guys go, then I don't have to take the mark of the beast. I will not worship the Antichrist or, or the prophet, and I'll be okay. Well, uh, there's a word that describes that line of thinking, and it's, it's, it's ignorant. Um, because here's what we need to understand. There is a time when Jesus is coming back. We need to understand this. There is a time when he is coming back. Remember in John, the 14th chapter, he's talking to his disciples just before he's taken away and executed, just before he gave up his life on the cross. And he said to them, let not your heart be troubled. In John 14, he said, let not your heart be troubled. In other words, don't worry about this. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, many rooms. And then he goes on to say, and if I go, which he did, didn't he? He said, and if I go, here's where I'm going to go. I'm going to go to prepare a place for you. And then he goes on to say, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm not going to leave you like orphans. I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you. So that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus has left, and he is coming back to get us. We know that. Now turn in your Bibles to Revelation uh, chapter 4. And John here says, And after these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And he says, there's a sound of a trumpet, a voice that sounds like a trumpet, and, and somebody says, come up here. Let me tell you something. There's going to be a time when the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel, and he's coming back for his church. I said he's coming back for his church. That's who he's, he's coming back for his body, the body of Christ. We right now are in the age of grace. The age of grace started when Jesus was crucified and died and was resurrected. You'll find in the book of Hebrews, on the day he was resurrected, he went into heaven and put his blood on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, which is called the mercy seat. And when his blood, when the perfect blood of the Lamb touched that altar, he was the perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice that was slain for mankind. When his blood touched the altar, the age of grace began. Jesus became the firstborn 
among many brethren. Now, it bothers some people, and honestly, you just got to get over it. Jesus became the first born again being. Somebody says, well, you can't be born again unless, unless you have sins. You know, we were old things passed away, all things became new. We became a new creation in Christ. That's true. Jesus didn't have his sins, he had yours. And he put your sins on the altar and his blood on the altar. And the scripture says he became the firstborn among many brethren. He became the first fruits into the kingdom. He took his place as the head of the church. And from that moment, then he came back and he was on the earth for 40 days teaching his family and friends about the kingdom that had come. And everyone who believed in him, everyone who believed in their heart that he was Lord Messiah, that everyone who believed in their heart that he was raised from the dead by God, everyone who believed that and confessed it with their mouth, according to the scripture, they were saved. They were born again. Some people say, well, no, I've always heard it preached that the church was born on the day of Pentecost when everybody had the Holy Spirit come upon them and they spoke in tongues. No, no, they, the people in the upper room were already saved. They were already saved. The day of Pentecost is when the baptism of the Holy Spirit came upon the church. So from the time Jesus put his blood on the altar until the time Jesus returns in the sky is the age of grace. The church age. The time when we who receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior and confess it with our mouth we become a part of his body. And he is coming back for his body. Now there's going to be people that say, well, yeah, right. I've heard that all my life. Well, turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. It says, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days. He says, Peter says, now, now get this. Know this. In the last days, there, there will be people who will be scoffers, and, and they're going to be here in the last days. You look up the word scoffer, and it means somebody that ridicules, somebody who mocks, somebody who says, oh, come on. This isn't going to happen. Look what he says, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust. Look at the next verse, verse 4. And saying, here's what the scoffers are going to be saying. Where is the promise of his coming? You've said for, for centuries that he was going to come. But where is this promise? For since the fathers fell asleep, and that word fell asleep is what the Bible refers to as Christians, their bodies dying. When a Christian dies, when we say, say it that way, when a Christian dies, it's not their spirit that dies, it's their fleshly body, and the Bible calls that falling asleep. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And here's the thing, people are judging, these scoffers are judging the, the future based upon the past. You know, that can be deadly. I'm, I'm telling you this, in your own daily life, you cannot allow the past to determine your future. Because if you let the past determine your future, then it's a downhill spiral. Everything with God gets better and better and better. Now listen, the scoffers are going to come. The scoffers are here today. There are people who are saying Jesus is not going to come back. But let me tell you something. Jesus is coming back, and he's coming back for his church. But here's what we need to understand. When he does come back and the church is taken away, there will be people left here on the earth. Now, growing up as, as a Baptist, and I, there's nothing wrong with Baptist. Billy Graham is my hero. Probably more people have been saved through his ministry than any ministry since the, the time of the apostles in the first century. 
But growing up as a Baptist, I, I remember uh, an evangelist coming to our church one time, and he said, you're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. The choice is yours. Well, you know, that's, I understand that. But it's not true. Thank you for your enthusiasm on that. But it's not true. See, the Bible in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, it talks about uh, we are spirit, soul, and body. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 31 and 32, it says that there's three groups of people on the earth. There's the Jews, the Christians, and the, and the Gentiles. Now, there's too much depth there for me to teach you all that needs to be taught as way of a background to this. But let me tell you this. When Jesus comes back, and this is Bible. This is not theory. This is Bible. When Jesus comes back, he's coming back for his church. Let's, let's turn over there right now to uh, 1 Thessalonians, and let's, let's get this clear here. 1 Thessalonians chapter, or 2 Thessalonians chapter 4. No, 1 Thessalonians. First Thess say 1 Thessalonians. Mm -hmm. for, <laughs> for 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Okay, if you got your Bibles. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. Paul here is saying, don't be stupid about this. I don't want you to not know this. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who have, what, fallen asleep. Now, what's he talking about here? Well, they've been preaching that Jesus was going to come back. And they've been preaching that Jesus is going to come back. And they preached that Jesus was going to come back. And here we are years later and some christians have started to die and so they're saying hey paul what about the christians that have died if jesus is coming back what about them and here's what he said but i don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep lest you sorrow as others who have no hope verse 14 for if we believe that jesus died and rose again do we believe that even so, God will bring with him. Now, who's the him it's talking about there? That's Jesus. So God is going to send with Jesus. Are you following me here? God will send with Jesus those who what? Sleep in Jesus. So many of you in this room, I have done funerals for your family members, many of you, at least a dozen or more in this room. The Bible says, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, that we are spirit, soul, and body. When that loved one of yours passed away, their body died and went to the ground. But according to the Word of God, their spirit went to be with Jesus, escorted by angels into the presence of the Lord. Paul put it this way, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So when Jesus comes back, he's going to bring with him the spirits of those who sleep in Jesus. Your dad, my dad. I know this sounds kind of odd to a lot of people because it hasn't been taught a lot. But when Jesus comes back, Raymond and Raymond, <laughs> her dad's Raymond, my dad's Raymond, and they were brother-in-laws, their spirits are coming back with Jesus. The Scripture says Jesus is going to appear in a cloud in the sky. What's the Bible tell us? It says we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses every born-again believer from the time Jesus put his blood on the mercy seat the day of his resurrection every born-again believer from that time until the time Jesus appears in the sky their spirits their bodies are dead in the ground but their spirits are in the paradise of God with Jesus and they and they have thought 
They have communication skills. Prove it all in the Bible. They have memory. They have desire. They have senses, taste, feel. Your dad and my dad are not just in some type of soul sleep someplace, off in suspended animation floating in outer space. They are in the presence of God waiting for the Father to send Jesus back to the earth to get their bodies. Waiting for Jesus to come back and when he appears in the clouds, when he appears in the sky, they will be with him, your mama, will be with him. Isn't that good? I mean, that's, that's like good news. All right. So why do you want to get saved before the rapture? So that you can be either, if you die, you can, your spirit will be with him, or if you're left on the earth, you'll be caught up that way. Now, let's go to the next verse. Verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive... So when, if Jesus comes back today, my dad, my cousin's dad, their spirits will be with the Lord. It says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Look, the next verse explains that. Verse 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ, that's referring to their bodies when it says dead, their dead bodies, I don't know if it'll be a DNA number called out or what, but if their ashes are scattered around the world, it makes no difference. Everything will come back together, their body will come back together, and they will be caught up. Look at the next verse. Verse 17. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where? In the air. This is not the second coming of Jesus. The second coming of Jesus, he touches down on the Mount of Olives and sets up his kingdom. That's not what this is. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now, the next verse. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. This should be a comfort. That's why we don't sorrow as other people do who have no hope. Now, here's the thing. When that happens, if it were to happen today, Ryan, would you preach for me next Sunday? No, if... <laughs> it's just a joke. If... <laughs> If this happens today, the dead bodies would be gathered together, caught up into the air. It's going to, we, are, we are told that that's going to happen first. And why are we told? Because there evidently is enough time in there that if, if you don't know it's going to happen, you get real freaked out. <laughs> so that happens first. The dead are caught up. And it, then it says, and then, and that Greek word there means that there's a little bit of time. It doesn't tell us how much little bit of time then we who are alive will be caught up with them now that's not referring to the you know when the Bible says in a moment in the twinkling of an eye that's not referring to how fast you're caught up I mean it's not like in the movies where it's like you're shot out with a catapult and a slingshot and you're flailing through space that's not the way it's gonna happen the Bible says in this Jesus is our model in this how did Jesus ascend in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he's standing there talking with his disciples, and it says, as he was talking, he began to ascend into the clouds. It's kind of like he's talking, and they're going, hey, 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 look at his feet. They're not touching the ground. Whoa. He's <laughs> so, but then somebody will say, yeah, but the Bible says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Read it in context. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye is talking about how fast we'll be changed he says in a moment in the twinkling of an eye mortality will drop off we'll take on immortality corruption will drop off we'll take on incorruption and we'll be like he is so we may not be caught up into the air instantly like that 
you know what I mean? But we will be caught up at some rate of speed. And once we all get caught up together in the air, then in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we're all changed. And we become as he is. And now listen to me. At that point, we have not just a resurrected body, but we have a resurrected, glorified body. And there's a difference. So Jesus had a resurrected body when he put his blood on the altar. Then he had a glorified body. Remember, he came back and he said, see, I'm flesh, see that I'm flesh and bone. Now, the phrase back then was flesh and blood, just like it is now. But why didn't Jesus to his disciples see that I'm flesh and blood? Why didn't he say, see, I'm flesh and blood, just like you guys? He didn't say that. He said, see that I am flesh and bone, because he had left his blood on the altar. And we're going to be just like him, with resurrected, the Bible says, resurrected, glorified bodies. It's a big deal. Now, here's what I want to get at. When we're caught up, there's still people on the earth. The scoffers, the ones who said, I don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. The uh, newscasters at MSNBC <laughs> and various people. <laughs> uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but the reality is, those who don't believe in Jesus, they're still here on the earth. Do they have an opportunity to believe? Yes, they do. They can decide not to take the mark of the beast. They can, after this happens, goes, oh my gosh, it must have been true. And they can make a decision to stand as a believer in Jesus Christ. But let me tell you what that gets them. The seven years of tribulation that takes place on this earth is no easy thing it is horrible from the beginning and at three and a half years it gets even worse and it is kind of like all hell on earth breaking loose the antichrist never does totally do everything that he uh, attempts to do but he really gives it a try now here's the whole thing if you make it through the tribulation if you don't take the mark of the beast if you're not killed during the tribulation or whatever and, and you did not deny Jesus, you will not go to hell. But you will not be a part of the body of Christ. And at the end of the seven years, Jesus comes back. And we could go through all of this. He comes back with the saints. Well, how can he come back with the saints? Because we have been resurrected and have our glorified bodies like his, and we're in heaven for seven years at the marriage supper of the Lamb and the judgment seat of Christ, and we are there for seven years, and at the end of the seven years, Jesus comes back and touches down on planet Earth, on the Mount of Olives, and sets up his kingdom. And when he does that, all the nations on Earth are brought before him and the nations are judged and the people are judged and the ones who did not take the mark of the beast and the ones who said Jesus is Lord I missed it but now I see I missed it he is Lord there and those who honored Israel they will be judged as sheep people and Nate and there will be some nations that will cease to exist after this but he will say, enter into my kingdom. Remember those scriptures? Enter into my kingdom. What kingdom is he talking about? The millennial kingdom. And these people will have life extended in regular physical bodies. If they were martyred during the um, tribulation, they will be resurrected into a physical body. And they will be living on the earth for a millennium in a physical body now somebody says well is that hell no that's not hell there is hell those who took the mark of the beast those who um, worshiped the beast and the false prophet uh, at this time when the nations are brought before Jesus our Lord he, he puts them he puts on one side he puts those that can come into the kingdom and on the other side it says he sends them into 
hell and damnation and outer darkness. They're gone. Satan is bound, put into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. But we are the glorified body of Christ. Now, I know the kids kind of like this idea, but it, I kind of do too. We're, it's kind of like superheroes. And I know it sounds almost like a joke, but the reality is the, the Scripture says we have a body like Jesus. Well, what kind of body did he have after he resurrected and got glorified? Well, he moved at the speed of thought. And if he wanted to go into a room, a door was irrelevant. And gravity didn't affect him. So for a thousand years, you know, the Bible says for a thousand years, the church, we reign as kings and priests with Jesus over the earth. Well, have you ever thought about this? Who are we going to be ruling and reigning over? Hello? This, this is not like everybody gets a prize no, we rule and reign over with him over the people who are living on the earth. Who are the people on the earth? The people on the earth are the ones who did not deny Jesus as Lord during the tribulation. They are the, the, the Jews are ruling and reigning out of the earthly Jerusalem. Israel is restored to its normal size. What the boundaries that the Bible says? The Bible says that during the millennium that nations that don't honor and bring their tithes and offerings to Israel during the millennium, it says it won't rain in their country. Well, where do you get that stupid idea? It's in the Bible. Some people say, well, I never heard that before. Well, let me ask you something. Have you ever read your Bible? See, this... What I'm telling you today, there's, there's not a single thing that I've talked to you about today that can't be backed up by Scripture. This is not theological theory by some denomination. This is what, like, the Bible says. And so at the end of the thousand years, Satan is released out of the bottomless pit, and then all of the people who have died throughout the centuries who did not have, uh, who were not people of faith, they are resurrected, and then at the end of the millennium, we have the great white throne judgment. And that's not a good place to be. You won't be there. And then we have a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem coming down. Let me tell you something. As a part of the church, you don't... I, I've even heard people say this. Well, you know, my, my uncle, he doesn't believe in Jesus, but once the rapture takes place, then he'll believe. Well, maybe he will. But the problem is, if he does, he's going to be in all eternity in a resurrected body and not a part of the church. Don't we love our friends and relatives enough that we want them to be a part of the glorified group, a part of the body of Christ? You say, well, what sets us apart into that group? What, what makes us so special? Well, let me put it to you in, in Bible terms. The Bible says that for all eternity... For all eternity, this group of people, us, the church, for all eternity, eternity is a long time. If anybody doubts the grace of God, if anybody says, well, how, how gracious are you? He can point at us lot. He can point at our group, the church, and he can say, look at them. I gave them salvation by the blood of my son. They didn't have to work for it, not by the works of their righteousness that they have done, but according to the blood of my son, Jesus, they got saved. They were a sorry lot. But while they were yet in sin, I loved them. And I made a decision that I'm going to make them just like my son, if they'll just believe. And I'm going to give them all of the inheritance that I'm going to give my son for all eternity. You want to know how much grace I have? Look at this would-be loser group here. I took them in as a son. That's how much grace I have. Hey, 
I want, I, I'm glad to be a part of this. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve it, but we got it. You know, the Bible says we, we as a, the body of Christ, the church, for all eternity, we will be joint heirs. And, and I know, Doc, you're from Colorado. It doesn't mean <laughs> joint heirs. No, we'll be, <laughs> we'll be co-heirs, <laughs> co-heirs with Jesus. Do you realize what that means? The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, Jesus, and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And nothing was made that was made unless it was made by the Word. There's a place in Colossians that says all things, now listen to this. People say, well, God made all this for us. Get over yourself. No, He didn't. The Bible says all things were made by Him, referring to Jesus, by him, now listen to this, and for him. Everything, everything that was made, and, it's, and it even says this, visible and invisible. That means all the angels and, and everything you can't see, all the dark matter in space, whatever it is. The reality is everything was made by him and for him. But here's the good news. God said we are joint heirs with him. Now this afternoon... My cousin, my dear cousin here, she's going over to see my sister. My sister and I are the only descendants of my mom. We're, we're the, the only two children. And according to the will, we are joint heirs. What that means is, is everything my sister gets, I get. Everything I get, she gets. We, we have everything together. Are you following me? Well, God made us, the church, joint heirs with Jesus. And the entire universe, all 90-some billion light years across the universe, we own it. And we can spend all eternity exploring it. So, do you want to wait to the rapture to make your decision? No. Look, having a resurrected body that lives on earth throughout eternity is better than hell. But it's not as good as being a part of the body of Christ. I want the best for my family. I want the best for my friends. I want them to receive Jesus. So when the trumpet toots and we shoot, they're all caught up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, did you learn anything today? I, I say, God is so good. God is so good. Ah. Uh, if, uh, if you want to know more about what we were talking about today, it's in the book, The Paradise of God. They have it up in the bookstore, I think. Um, if they don't, you can get it on Amazon or something. God is good. Let's stand. Father, in the name of Jesus, we proclaim your goodness. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for making a way, for making the way that we can spend all eternity with you. We thank you, Father, for your grace in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.